Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope everyone's well. It's finally, yeah, it's the week that Ireland arrive. Ireland are in South Africa. The test matches we've been waiting for the entire time. This is the, the unofficial, I suppose, world incredibly champion. skillful. Probably up there with New Zealand, if not surpassing New Zealand now with their skill sets. Maybe the All Blacks friends of ours might disagree, but you're talking about the, the Kings of Europe, the Six Nations champions against the Springboks, the world champions. And of course, Ireland are the only team the Springboks haven't beaten under Rossi Rasmus. So there's a lot of needle. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a huge, huge week and two massive test matches. I can't wait. I must have been... It's been a while since I've been so excited about a test match over here. Uh, I was lucky to, lucky to be in Paris for the last meeting of them where Ireland won and beat the Springboks in the World Cup. But yeah... This is a week. We're in Pretoria. It's where I live in Pretoria. It's my hometown. Uh, it's the home of the Bulls, Fortress Loftus. It's going to be a massive game for both sides. And, and so much to talk about. So I'm going to try and unpack some of the issues, some of the uh, build-up, and some of the look ahead to what's going to happen. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you want to know in the comments below. But otherwise, uh, we're, going to, we're going to go for it and see. And this is my preview of the Irish series. Ireland's biggest thing is they've got four provinces, not a lot of rugby players. The Irish team is, I would say, 70-80% uh, Leinster. And Leinster plays together in the URC, in the Champions Cup. It's not new guys that you have to bring together and have to coach every single time. I mean, half the team that will come here now, when we play them in June, will be Leinster-based players. And I think they developed so much depth and so many world-class players in a number of positions not just reliant on one or two guys so i think they've got 160 contracted rugby players we have 400 600 uh, professional rugby players so we have the luxury that when a player struggles with a catch pass or he struggles to pass to his left uh, you kind of work with him a little bit if he doesn't get better ah oh, here's a new prodigy coming through so we just select him and that guy's out again so that's the first thing they do precision farming the pathways in Ireland are really well developed. They're really streamlined, they're really efficient. Guys come through as really complete players with really rounded skill sets. The thing that, that probably uh, struck me the most when I was in Ireland was the amount of detail that they will coach the players. A, a microscopic detail. When I was here in South Africa, before I went there, I didn't go into a tenth of the depth of detail and microscopicness that they would go into. They are maximizing all of their possible strengths. So yeah, I think that's probably why Ireland have been the best team in the world over the last two or three seasons. Okay, so let's start. Um, Springbok's history against Ireland has always been, we had the contentious uh, 2016 Test Series where CJ Stander took out Pat Lambie, I think we all remember that. South Africa came back to win that Test Series, winning the second and third Test of, after losing the first one. But Irish rugby's been on the rise since then. and, and Amongst their clubs, Leinster, it's been, uh, and Munster, and Connacht, and and, uh, and Ulster, it's been quite a rivalry that's been building, and even more so with South Africa's entry into the URC. We're seeing a real rivalry um, developing, especially when you think Munster beat the Stormers last year in, in the URC final, and Leinster lost to the Bulls in the semi-final. At Loftus in another epic game, so there's some massive rivalries coming along, and just at national level, um, yeah, the Springboks haven't won since 2016. So uh, it's a huge test series, but let's look at, look at those last games since then. 2017 was under Alistair Kutsia, it was part of a, a tour, a disastrous tour for the Springboks. They went to Dublin and they lost quite heavily, probably one of the worst losses ever for Springbok rugby. Um, yeah, it's not something we'd like to see, but um, Ireland was so dominant and that scoreline so so wide that I think it was part of the time we were really worried for the future of Springbok rugby. But if you if you've forgotten, take a look here. Of course, then we had the Springboks uh, you know, carrying on under Rossi and, and the, the resurgence and then winning in the World Cup in 2019 in Japan. The teams then met again in 2022 in Dublin. Uh, yeah, not a long time since those last meetings. 
and a tough clash it was and a huge clash where you know Ireland flew into the box and and the box weren't quite the, the finished article there there were some uh, some niggles around in that game and and a couple of missed goal kicks the box missed a number of opportunities on attack and uh, you know two missed uh, I think it's three missed uh, kicks in the game lost by six points uh, a tough game as well in Dublin and credit to the Irish they really showed they were world championship contenders world cup contenders with a win like that and um given their results as well uh, yeah over the the rest of the time uh, they certainly have built up a, a, a amazing stat an amazing uh, sort of sort of resilience under Andy Farrell uh, but yeah yes that 2022 clash if you've forgotten this was what happened Of course, the other big thing that happened in Irish rugby at that stage, they went to New Zealand, nobody gave them a chance, and they won the Test Series there. Uh, a magnificent Test Series, their first one in New Zealand, and, and huge uh, sort of self-reflection for the All Blacks after that. It was probably the beginning of the end for Ian Foster, uh, but yeah, it sort of really took a dent into the arm of the All Blacks at that stage, and a magnificent win. Even if New Zealand get the ball here and run it down the other end, there isn't enough time to restart and go again. Ireland can savor these moments as Mac Henson charge. Can there be a cherry on top? Conor Murray. Ireland's confidence and a roar as the clock goes red. And Joey Carberry will kick to touch to end the game. And they have done it. Last week was historic in its own right. Ireland beating the All Blacks in New Zealand for the very first time. But this raises the achievement now to simply epic proportions. So that's the background to this test series. Since then, South Africa have lost in 2023 to Ireland. Uh, and we'll get to that game now. Uh, but they've gone on and won the World Cup in 2023. Double World Cup champions, back-to-back -back champions. And certainly, you know, that rivalry has continued in the URC as well. We're seeing a growing rivalry between South African and Irish teams in all levels. And uh, certainly something that we want to see carry on. Uh, and this test series is just going to add to that spice. So that's why it makes this so interesting. Ireland have never won a test series in South Africa. That's going to be their goal. That's going to be huge. And after New Zealand, there's no ways the Springboks can take them lightly, especially with the record over the past couple of years. In fact, we'd have to go as far as Rassi Erasmus saying that Ireland are, are favourites for the series, especially given the fact that they, they've won every game since 2016. But don't take my word for it. Listen to Rossi. Uh, well, if there's one team that's uh, certainly got the upper hand, it's, it just shows on paper that since 2016, uh, I never want to make us the underdogs. And we, don't, we don't want to be the underdogs, but I mean, uh, the stats is there. We haven't beaten them since 2016. Since then, Ireland have gone on to win the Six Nations. Uh, yeah, they've really been exceptional. Um, we dominated the Six Nations this year. Uh, we're an exceptional side in winning that Six Nations. And just sort of kicked on from their World Cup disappointment and really added uh, you know, some, some strings to their bow. And, and they, they certainly look, at least the last time they played internationals, as a side that is, if not number one in the world, number two in the world. And, yeah, they are certainly going to contend with the box and they certainly want the box crown um, of course we keep on hearing from commentators overseas about how Ireland France was in this year's Six Nations was the World Cup final that everybody wanted I'm not sure who everybody was but maybe those in those two countries would have thought that the point being uh, you know, Ireland's history in the World Cup is rather disastrous they haven't ever got past the quarter final they were extremely unlucky against the All Blacks the All Blacks were exceptionally good on that night and the All Blacks made it through to the final so yeah there's there's a lot of sort of what ifs and doubts and those sort of things in Irish rugby at the moment uh, they they certainly have a good side one of the best in the world they certainly can put it together but in World Cups they've they've had some failures and and the margins are slim so uh, I know it's easy to to bag Irish rugby or their World Cup history but um, yeah, the margins are extremely slim. The All Blacks could have easily lost that game as well. And yeah, if you look at the box winning the World Cup, you see how slim it was. One point margins in three consecutive games to win the World Cup. That's how close rugby is nowadays. And there's all indications that this series is going to be no different. 
But let's look at Ireland in the Six Nations. They what made made them so good? Um, what made them so exceptional? And how they won? They they are an extremely polished side. They love to play with the ball in hand. They love to keep coming at you, and they use their quick ruck speed, uh, a, a superb defence, and they really enjoy you know just sort of keep coming at you until the gaps come, and then they they ho hope to exploit that. It's pretty much a lot like the Insta play as well, uh, although the Insta's game plan is quite different to in, in certain aspects. But uh, let's go through the stats and you can see where some of the, the successes are. Now, I don't actually have the access to all the stats that some of the coaches do, but this is just to uh, just to show some of the uh, standout players. Uh, when it comes to carries in the Six Nations, of course, Ben Earl was from England was top of there. But Caelan Doris, very highly rated. Bundy Aki, with the Springboks rate very highly, also very high on that list. And that's for the entire Six Nations this year. Then if you look at the tackle evasion rate, um, Ireland not as good as some of the other t teams in this, but uh, still pretty high. Uh, yeah, they, they don't evade tackles that often, but that's not where their strength lies. And I think when we come to the next stat, we'll, we'll see exactly where their strength lies in the Six Nations. In contact meters, that's where they make a lot of it. Not only do they keep the ball a lot, but they, they obviously move with the ball even while in tackles. So when they make contact, they still they pump their legs and they still make uh, momentum forward. And that gives them the momentum with quick ruck speed to get the ball out wide as well. Some more individual stats there, looking at... Uh, the offloads, James Lowe very high on that, Robbie Henshaw as well. Both of them make a lot of meters on the outside when Ireland attack. Line breaks, of course, James Lowe definitely high up there. Maybe not the best in the Six Nations, but very effective with the line breaks. And kicks in play, interesting one as well, that he's the guy who tends to be under pressure, but at, at the back there and use the kicks in play quite a bit. And just to underline how important James Lowe is to the team, if you look at the Six Nations stats, most meters carried by any player. Very involved. Bundy Aki is also in that top six over there. Meters gained as well. James Lowe again at the top there. Uh, and some big names in that one. And then total passes. That's one player they're going to miss a lot this year. Is uh, Jameson Gibson Park, who gives them a lot of direction there. And uh, without him, it's going to be interesting to see what Ireland do. Then let's get to that night in Paris in 2023. Um, it was an epic game, probably the game of the tournament up to that point until the quarterfinals sort of usurped that. Uh, yeah, Ireland were exceptional on the night. They took their chances. They did what they had to do. They stood up to the physicality and they beat the Springboks 13-8. Of course, if South Africa had their goal kicking uh, better, <laughs> probably would have been a different result. Maybe, maybe not. It's hard to say at the moment. That's something that fans argue about. Yeah, we leave it to that. But... Um, on the night, the box weren't good enough, and they certainly uh, you know, took a lot of flack from that loss we saw on Chasing the Sun, the aftermath, how Rossi and them reacted. Uh, yeah, they certainly are, it is certainly one of those that, that hurt the box badly, especially because they haven't beaten Ireland under Rossi. And the, yeah, that's going to really come back in this series as well. We're going to see a lot of focus on that. The box are going to use that sort of emotion and that yeah, to, to, to feel them on their home grounds. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a hell of a tough series. But on that night in Paris, uh, money the box kicking wasn't there. Uh, Ireland scored the try. The box also missed chances. They were beaten at the breakdowns. Uh, and to hear this a clip from back just after the game, Sia Khaleesi sort of summed it up per uh, perfectly. Yeah, we're obviously going to work on it. I mean, as Jock said, we didn't lose the game in one department. There were a lot of, I mean, we gave away, I think, 12 penalties. Yeah. And a lot of them were in the breakdown. Some are taking some uh, defensive breakdown. So you can't blame one specific area. We've got to get better. And we created such good opportunities. And then we go to the 22 and we didn't take those opportunities. And in a game like this, in a level like this, if you don't take those opportunities, um, this is what happens. But I thought... Quite a few things went well. I thought our D was was good, and I think, um, as Jock said, as the 
the, intensi the intensity of the game was exactly what we needed for a lot of the players that have never played under such intensity. I mean, the, the, the whole atmosphere was, was, was amazing on the field, but we know exactly what we need to do as a group. And uh, we've got to lift our heads. We've got a big game coming next week. I mean, if, we, for, if we're going to dwell too much on what happened today, and we will forget to, to perform next week because we need to get through that one. And then we can start thinking about afterwards. But Tonga is an important game. Yeah, I thought they were, they were more accurate than us um, today. And they were a bit faster in the breakdown. But as Jack said, we, we knew it was coming. Obviously, we were attacking so well and we got to the 22 when we could have um, gained points. The opportunities that we lost were all through um, the breakdown. <clears throat> And obviously, that's, that's us as players. We take full responsibility of that. We'll obviously, hopefully, meet them again. Now, and obviously, we have to be better going next week against Tonga. But I thought they were, they were a little bit quicker than us. And that's why they were able to get those opportunities. Since then, there's been a lot of talk about the series. A lot of looking forward to what's happening. When the team was announced, there was, I mean, the, 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 the games were sold out quite quickly as well. Um, yeah, there's really a sense of anticipation. A lot of hype building around the games and it started off and um, we saw it first of all with um, Eben talking about how the Irish players were after they beat the Springboks uh, on Jim Hamilton's show. So <clears throat> the we know how the result of the game so Ireland played really well Springboks a close game and then there was the one of the final plays of the game was Eben I'm going to say it got picked up by James Lowe and that was the, they made this kind of big thing and the big hurrah and then zombies started blasting out and then the lads are doing like the walk round to thank the crowd after. And then Eben saw him after, said, mate, how was that? And he was, obviously said it was a tough game. I says, fucking Ireland, he's, he's like, mate, we'll get them back. We'll get them back if they make it. Yeah. That's what he said, if they make it. And they never did. They never made it. But now yeah, they're coming back. So the thing was, why I say that, so after the game, they were always, always you shake the guy's hands and probably... 12 out of the 23, when, when I shook the hand, they, they told me, see you guys in the final. And my immediate thought was because the way the logs worked out, we were going to play France and they were going to play New Zealand. And my immediate thought was, are these guys seriously not even thinking about the All Blacks in the World Cup quarterfinal playing against them? So that remark, what they made, see you guys in the final, I was just like, yo, these guys are making a big mistake to look past probably the one of the most dominant teams, or probably the most dominant team in the last 20 to 30 years of Test Rugby. And I was just like, surely they can't. I mean, we, we would never say that too, because we know we at the host nation and we were going to have to pitch up to, to beat France in their backyard. And yeah, it just felt like they were just so, so confident saying, saying things like that to you in the final when you know We've got the, the mighty All Blacks coming up in the, in the World Cup quarterfinal. Did you say anything? Like when they said, did you say, if, uh, you, if you get there? Yeah, I said it in my head. And I remember <laughs> that I, think, <laughs> I think France Malerba was, was, was with me. And I said, and with the Yach, and I said, I don't know if these guys are, are riding a bit a bit high because obviously it's good to be confident, but you, you can never be arrogant in this game because you can be here yeah, the next week and, and down. Can shoot, and that, and it can the, shoot you down there. That's this game. the thing about rugby. Um, you can have the best season, and you can have one slip up or, or one miss, miss tackle, and a guy puts you on your ass. And that's that's the beauty of this game. You you never on top forever. You yeah. And then Damon con Damon Delenda continued it and said, uh, yeah, that the, the the box needed to win some respect back. Also on Jim Hamilton's show, and it's quite interesting because the Irish media have made quite a bit on that. And if you watch the entire clip. Uh, the, the comments weren't as 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 massive as probably was made out to be, but certainly, you know, they the type of comments that you could easily turn and twist and use to your advantage. And the Irish media have been using them quite well. No, it's it's obviously. In, I think it was a bit more intense than every other group stage match in terms of, I think, mindset and physicality wise. But I just yeah, Ireland are in, they, I think they're incredible. I think they're very well coached. Um, the attacking shape is incredible, the way they get their passes off nine and who they pass to off nine. Um, and especially when they get momentum and how they play off nine. I think their forward runners are so aligned. Um, and it's tough, to, it's tough to stop. Even 
even with us at the Springboks, when we are making dominant hits, it, it still felt like in that test match that they were just getting quick ball and they were always on the front foot, even though we were, it felt like we were being more dominant the whole time. But I think Ireland's biggest threat is their break down. I think they are so good at the break down that no matter if they are getting dominated in contact, um, they still manage to get the ball out quick enough. I'm looking forward to it the most because it's the first test match for us together again as a group after winning the World Cup again in front of our home crowd and we never got that luxury after winning the 2019 World Cup because of COVID and mm. everything like that. So I think that first game against Ireland at Loftus, whether I play or not, I think it's going to be, yeah, it's, I think, yeah, I think you guys should fly down and come watch a test match because I think it's just going to be, yeah, I think it's going to feel like almost like a war mm. um, because they, they, I think a lot of people give them the credit to be number one in the world because they play such good footy, but it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a flipping incredible battle out there. Hundred percent. Do you think Ireland are your bogey team, though? Do you think do you feel like there's this thing in the back of the minds that they're the team to beat, especially at home? Let's build up the importance of that win. Yes, I know it's the four-year cycle. Yeah. But if it was like Ireland, maybe do ha or they feel that they have your number in the World Cup. Like could have went either way. You know, there was a yeah. couple of opportunities. And obviously, that Test match in Dublin in 2022 was also a tough loss. Mm. Um, so yeah, there has been a few tough games against them, and obviously we lost to them in. I think 2017 when they beat us 39-3 or something. That yeah. was, I think, the disrespect we got from them after that test match. I wouldn't say the players. Maybe the players um, felt like they, we were just very shit, which we were shit on the day. But like the way the media spoke and the way they disrespect, I think they completely just disrespected us. So I think for us as a as a group and us as Springboks, it's just getting that respect back. We're not for their respect but for our own respect mm. um, we i think yeah we, we we don't need to we we really want to beat ireland and uh yeah like i said it's going to be an incredible test match and of course there's been a lot made in the irish media of south africa it was the irish media as well in 2019 a bunch of them had turned up at matt proudfoot's press conference and asked him all sorts of questions about doping off the springboks released a picture of them in the in the change room uh, and the Irish guys were from all accounts, from all the journalists, I wasn't in the room that day, but uh, all the journalists who were there were, sort of felt that there was a definite line of questioning going on, that they were looking for a story of this, on the Springboks and doping. Of course, it was just after Piwe de Yanti uh, uh, got tested positive for doping, so there was a lot going on in that press conference. Um, Ong Chien from Off The Ball in Dublin, how are things? Very well, thank you. And yourself? Very well. Uh, so there's been a lot written in Irish media over the last couple of days uh, about rugby and drugs in rugby. And uh, a question for you, as somebody who's worked in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, it's kind of a two-pronged question. We've had to ask hard questions in Ireland of underage players in, in schools as well. Does rugby have a doping issue and does South African rugby have a doping issue? I think um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a forwards coach, mate. You know, that's, that's something for administrators to to answer on. Um, I wouldn't have have a, to be able to answer that question. I don't have the information to answer that question. Um, you know, if you ask me something about the game specifically, I can answer that. But uh, I mean, that's that's for administrators. Are you concerned at all about the image of South African rugby? I think the image of South African rugby is portrayed about what you see on the field. You know, uh, we, we're competitive. We're a competitive nature, nation. Um, if you look at uh, from our sevens, sevens team, are well they're competing on the world stage. Uh, our junior side, third in the world championships, junior championships. Uh, the, the Springboks competing well, the women's team qualifying. For, so I think that's the image of, 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 of South African rugby that needs to be attained. I think um, if, if from a sports spectator point of view, of course, doping in sport is something that continually needs, not just rugby, continually needs to be addressed on a worldwide on a worldwide platform. So um, to, to talk about it from, from an assistant coach position, I don't think it's my role to, to speak about. And there's been this sort of needle between South Africa and, and Ireland all along, and, and those two comments from Eamon and Damien just confirm it. Of course, then what made it a bit worse is a couple of days later, Simon Zivo, who's a great rugby man and you know, the boxer that respect him quite a bit, went on uh, a, a podcast and made these comments. Uh, yeah, he, he had a few headlines for sure. Um, but to be fair, to to his point, like I think the I, 
the media probably did get a bit out of control mm. here with the the hopes and expectations and um I suppose it was a little bit extra around South Africa because Razi had obviously coached us here in Munster and he's been involved in the Irish setup and Jacques Nienaber is now coaching in Leinster. Um, and there's a big rivalry. Uh, Razi like, hates the Irish. <laughs> he really, <laughs> he really doesn't like us. <laughs> um, which is quite funny. So, the, like, it will build up even more. And it feeds, it drip feeds into the players. RG Snyman's been ca- copying a little bit of slack over it. Um, he's the only one left, I think, in our squad. And Jean Klein as well. But, um, yeah, they, there, there is a really, really big rivalry there and it's bubbling. It's, it's, yeah, it's mainly the Irish media's fault. Based in Dublin, I think, as well. Not the, not the Irish media down here where I am. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a juicy test series for sure. Again, the headlines blew up. Again, it was made a huge thing of uh, until Rusty sort of poured water on the fire, but left a little bit of a edge at the end of this press conference uh, in his quote when talking about Simon Zebo. Uh, then just in the Simon Zebo thing, I mean, he messaged me. Uh, people who know Simon Zebo would know he's he's a he's a joke. He's a joker, you know. He, Every, every chance he gets, he makes a joke or a little crack here and there. And I immediately uh, messaged me and says, listen, yeah, that came out totally wrong. They, they totally didn't understand what I was trying to say. Uh, he apologized and said, must he go back on air and rectify it? I said, no, man, uh, it's spice it up. Uh, let's keep it that way. So the box want to spice it up. It's certainly going to get spicy this week. We uh, can see a huge, huge test series coming on. Uh, there's a, so much to play for. Uh, both teams are pretty well known. We're not going to see too many surprises. Uh, but yeah, the atmosphere, and it's going to be the team that holds their nerves the most. There's certainly something in it for both teams. I don't want to prove that they weren't as a, a quarter finalist only in the World Cup and they deserve to be amongst the top teams in the world rugby. They want to, will want to beat the world champions uh, and as uh, some sort of vindication. Springboks, of course, with a, that record of not having beaten Ireland uh, since 2016, they will want to erase that. It's the one one marker left under Rossi Rasmus that they haven't been able to to, to sort of mark off uh, and take off their, their charts. But... Um, yeah, it's going to be massive, guys. I'm so looking forward to Saturday at Loftus. Uh, it's, <laughs> I think we're going to see a, a literal epic rugby war. The hits are going to be massive, and I can't wait until it arrives. Okay, so let's look at where the, the, the teams will play. They'll be playing at Loftus first Club. Very well known to Irish fans. That's where Leinster lost a couple of weeks ago. That was a place where Rossi and them also said uh, Bulls fans sh- or Springbok fans shouldn't be too complacent. The fact that uh, Leeds the lost because they now have experienced Loftus, they've experienced the altitude, and as Glasgow Warriors showed, the altitude is not always a factor uh, as they came back and beat the Bulls in the final at Loftus as well. But the altitude certainly will be something, the crowd will certainly be there, uh, and uh, it's going to be a huge day out for Ireland. They know how to handle this sort of pressure. I mean, they've been in the World Cup, they've beaten the box in front of what 70 odd thousand at Stade de France, um, and it was an epic evening that night. Uh, but, yeah, saying that, yeah, this is a different type of pressure at Loftus Firstfeld. The box will want to use it. They've got a great record at Loftus Firstfeld. And uh, that crowd will certainly, hopefully, be able to carry them when, when they're there. Um, you know, the, 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 both teams are pretty well established, uh, as I've said before. Uh, but Loftus has got that certain thing. The air is a bit thinner. Uh, but if you're Ireland, you have to do almost like what Franco Smith said in, in his post-match press conference that, yeah, yeah the, the altitude's always going to be there. You've just got to realize, would you want to die for a rugby game and how far will you push yourself? And that's the question Ireland have to ask themselves. I'm sure they'll have done all their preparation before this. They'll have planned for this. They know uh, of the altitude. Their players have experienced it. They've been to Pretoria before, most of them. So they know what to expect and they know what they're going to find in, in Pretoria. They are staying in Joburg, though. So that little bit of extra you know, coming up from, from on the N1 should be quite interesting. But uh, yeah, that's the first test venue, Loftus Fersfeld. And as you can see in some of these drone shots I did a while back, uh, a, a really a stunning stadium and, and definitely going to be a sellout, 53,000. Uh, we're expecting a massive game. 
And then Kings Park Durban, also a huge stadium, a uh, very different stadium, very, you feel almost if you f sit on the blower parts, you feel almost on the ground, you, there's parts where you sit actually underneath, uh, lower than the, the ground level, so you get a very interesting aspect. Then you have the nosebleed seats, which are probably some of the steepest seats I've ever sat in in my life. They, they're up top in the, in the nosebleed seats, you got to really watch your balance and you really can't have a couple of too many beers on those ones. But also Durban Kings Park is a magnificent stadium for rugby and certainly going down to sea level from altitude will help both sides. Probably the Irish a bit more, uh, but Durban is also a, a huge fortress for South African rugby. So we're going to see two epic test games at those two venues. Uh, they both sold out. It's going to be massive. Um, and yeah, and I suppose the final thing is how are they going to line up? Now, this is Monday. I'm recording this. Uh, we haven't had the Springbok team. We'll have it on Tuesday. Don't see too many changes from the World Cup lineup. Uh, obviously, Rossi can spring a surprise, but I doubt it. I think they're probably going to go with tried and tested with probably Evan Ruiz at eight or Quacker Smith at eight, one of the two, depending on what Rossi's thought processes are. But the one who's not in will be on the bench. Uh, at wing, probably expect Cheslin and Kurt the Orange, uh, Vili Rue at the back, uh, Jesse and Damien at, uh, at midfield, maybe Andre Este is on the back, uh, fly off Andre, uh, goal kicking is going to be huge, if if you just see those last two times they've played, goal kicking has cost the spring box, that's going to be massive in this game as well, um, and yeah, uh, just looking half back, if Fuff is okay, he'll play, otherwise I think Grant Williams or Corbis Reinach will get the nod, uh, probably see Quibus on, they're going to go probably more with experience. Uh, and then uh, I would probably play Quacha at 8, Evan, depending on what type of game they want to play. Peter Steff and, uh, at 7, Sears at 6, he'll captain the side. Uh, probably Franco Mostert at 5, Evan at 4. Uh, or Arches Neyman, he'll be around there in the mix, if not in the starting lineup in the match day 23. And then the front row, both, any of the, those forwards that they can pick will be a, a huge factor for the Springboks. They, they will want to milk the scrums for penalties. They want to put Ireland under pressure there. Uh, certainly didn't get the reward against Wales that they should have got, thanks to the referee, uh, who didn't always see it their way, but they were totally dominant there. And I think that's going to be a huge part, the set piece of South Africa's attack as well. Uh, Ireland are extremely good on the breakdown. Josh van der Fleer is, is exceptional. Caelan Doris is, mag, uh, is magnificent in terms of the, 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 the cleans and the and he's just all-round presence there. Um, at wide, the likes of James Lowe is almost always a threat. Uh, Bundy Aki is highly rated by the Springboks. They really rate him as one of the biggest threats in the Irish team. Uh, but there's so many threats across the park. And uh, it was a good little bit of shithousery, as they say, from Rossi on Saturday to uh, release... <laughs> Rossi's tweets are always quite fun. So what he did is Rossi doesn't follow people on Twitter. The only person he follows at the moment is Irish Rugby. Uh, that's on purpose. Uh, yeah, <laughs> There's a little bit of a mind game going on there. And then, of course, he named, he put on paper a team, and he has the team on the screen, uh, that Ireland, he believes Ireland will pick. Of course, Ireland will be without Mac Hansen. He's, he's injured without Hugo Keenan, who's at the sevens. Without Johnny Sexton, who's obviously retired now, uh, but they still got a formidable squad. And if you look at that squad, there's there's a lot of experience and a lot of world class players there. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see how accurate Rossi is. Did he play a mind game with Farrell? Will Farrell uh, pick one or two surprises? Who knows? Um, but certainly at fly off, I think Ireland, um, if they're vulnerable anyway, that it might be there. And without Jameson Gibson Park at scrum off. The halfbacks are going to certainly be under pressure, and if I was the box, I'd probably put them under pressure there. Um, yeah, so that's that's a summing up of, of the test series. There'll be a lot more on this channel in the week. All the press conferences will be up, and there'll be a lot more of these type videos coming up as well. So keep in touch and uh, watch these this channel, uh, and let me know what you think. Who do you think is going to come up? I've got a poll up on this on the... Uh, <laughs> 
I've got a poll up on YouTube as well, which asks you all who you think, what's the result going to be of the two test series. But let me know in the comments as well, where do you think the vulnerabilities of the Springboks or the uh, Irish are? And let's get a bit of a discussion going. But uh, And yeah, if you have any questions as well, feel free to send them. If there's time, I'll do a Q&A piece as well. But uh, if you haven't watched, if you haven't uh, smashed that subscribe button, we have to ask these things, unfortunately. Please do. And yeah, there'll be a lot more videos like this. But thank you for watching. And here's to a magnificent, huge test series that hopefully meets its expectations. Cheers. Yeah, just the last thing as I was finishing off this video, uh, Rossi went and released a, a video from Stade France last year. Uh, the Irish fans singing Zombie. Of course, if you're going to love this, you'll know the South African fans sing it with a bit of a different chorus. Uh, but let's end off the video there. And thanks for watching. Cheers.